As a child in Jamaica, at say eight years old, I was in primary school and didn't have very much to worry about except um, we had a goat that we had to go tie out and, you know, take him out pick get feeding for the rabbits and get off to school. Well the thing that one of the things I remembered most was the Christmas time celebrations. This always included <coughs> the John Canoe. John Canoe was or is <coughs> uh is comprised of da a company of dancers, costume dancers, and drummers. Two drummers and a five player. And it can be any number of costume dancers. And that was my first realization of, of my affinity for, for rhythms was at eight o'clock at eight years old because I used to listen to I used to wait for Christmas to come, you know. I was scared of the costumes, but the drums was okay, you know. So at eight I'd be waiting for Christmas to come out and I still think the best sound the best drum sound I ever got was out of the wall of my kitchen at that time, yes. Because I used to play drunk, uh, I used to play junk on the rhythms on, on the kitchen wall with my hands. Of course, I had no idea that I'd end up doing this, you know. As far as music and my parents were concerned, <clears throat> In those days, you couldn't even contemplate telling your parents you were going to embark on a career in music. I mean, they, they think you were crazy. <laughs> so, as far as telling my parents that this is what I was going to do, that was totally out of the question. Actually, I didn't know what I was going to do until much later you know, maybe 15 years later. I was in a motor accident and my best friend died. And we had just changed seats like maybe 20 miles before. And uh, I was kind of shaken up by the whole thing, you know. And I thought that after doing everything that everyone, everyone else thought was correct for the first almost 25 years of my life, I'd take the next 25 to do something that I really wanted to do. And in the course of struggling with myself and thinking about it and whatever, I decided that what I wanted to play was hand drums. I took somebody's drum, actually he was like, he was going around with my sister and he had a drum and I needed it so I took it. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. And um, I practiced like eight hours a day 
for ten and a half months. Not knowing what I was doing, what I was trying to do was to get to get um to duplicate the sounds that I heard my drum my kind of drums make on record or on the radio, which was on record. Remember now that I can't tell my parents about this, that this is what I'm going to do. So I told them I was living in the country part of Jamaica. So I told them I was going to Kingston to visit with the other side of the family. And that's as far as I could go. And the next time they saw me was two and a half years later. I was passing through town playing with Carlos Malcolm and the Afro Jamaicans and we were doing a show in my hometown. So. I traveled with my congas and a suitcase to Indianapolis, Indiana in December. 1973. I went at the invitation of an organization called the International Jazz Library and they moved from Indianapolis to Beaufort, South Carolina in like April of 74. In 74 I went to New York and was lucky enough to be in Atlantic Studios when they were putting together a band for the great man with the bango and was in the right time at the right place. So uh, I did that for a while and then I met Taj Mahal's road manager and they invited me to come out and tour with him behind an album called More Roots. And I did that and they were going abroad. And I opted to stay because my papers were expired and I wasn't quite ready to go home yet. Because I didn't, uh, I hadn't yet found out, you know, what I had come to America to find out which is whether my the stuff that I had was good or just Jamaica good and I wasn't ready to go home yet so I took the chance you know I stayed of course my situation is now is entirely legal so I don't expect anybody to come knocking on my door Thank you. <laughs> well, it wasn't quite hundreds of people that came to see me when I went back home, but the it was kind of satisfying, you know, uh, our gratifying to, to see that when uh, I hadn't really lived in Jamaica since 73 and this was 2008, 2007 we were talking about and what happened was that somebody told somebody who told two friends who told two friends that I was home and getting set to do an album over at Harry J's and like I went with like a short time after I got to the studio it was like all these old friends musicians and non-musicians I mean like that first day was like I'm saying wow man I didn't even think anybody remembered me let alone you know a whole bunch of people be coming out and stuff it was, it was kind of a good feeling, a kind of real homecoming, you know. But Jamaicans are notorious for, um, 
for keeping track of their own, you know? So, while we're still talking Jamaica jazz, here's some more folk you need to be reminded of. Piano players, York the Souza, Baba Mota, Monty Alexander, and Orville Hammond. Jazz. 